on. Uh, can you all hear me? And can you see on the screen? Can you see the? Um, can you see the uh, slide that says history of the Texas party system? Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Let me do this real quick. I want to make sure that I, yeah, okay. All right, so um, you, those of you, I think everybody who's here today was also in the class session on uh, Tuesday. I could be wrong about that. If you weren't, um, we watched a uh, lecture by University of Houston political science professor Richard Murray. That was the bulk of the class meeting. And I told you to, you know, kind of alerted you before we pressed play on that to be on the lookout for certain information. And in fact, as the uh, lecture was playing, I even put some things up here on the uh, up on the board. So I thought we'd take a few minutes and run through that. Um, I even suggested to you that we would do that in today's class meeting. Um, so uh, let's just start with some of these predictions that Murray made. Um, so the first one I have here on the list is that in the 2010 gubernatorial election should be competitive. In fact, a little bit later, he says that Bill White, who was the Democratic candidate in 2010 for governor, running against Rick Perry, the Republican incumbent candidate, he said that Bill White should get more than 45% of the vote. So let's see how his strategy uh, or how, how his prediction played out there. I have the results here okay, on the screen. This is from, I think the source here is just Wikipedia, but this is the kind of thing that you can be, you can be fairly comfortable with information from Wikipedia on this. I think it's generally okay with this kind of information. Uh, you can see that he doesn't get 45% of the vote, okay? So Murray was a little bit off there, overstated that a little bit. Uh, you know, and, and yeah, I guess it depends on your perspective, how you look at it. And things like this, though, maybe for political scientists, people like me, three to four percentage points is actually kind of a big, a big miss. Yes. Um, a relatively big. I mean, it's not huge, but it's it's. If it had been forty-four percent or something like that, I'd say I would have got pretty close, right? But he's almost three full percentage points off in his prediction. Uh, so he, he was, as as someone who was advocating for or arguing that it was desirable for the Democrats to be more competitive, not that the Democrats necessarily win, but the Democrats be more competitive, he must have been disappointed by the results. Okay. And then another, um, another uh, prediction that he made was that turnout in the 2010 election should be somewhere around five and a half million. So let's see, let's see what that turned out to be. Oh, that looks a little bit different than I thought it was going to be. Let's see here. Okay, so we'll just do some quick arithmetic here. Got to find the governor's race. There we go. So uh, it looks like he um, he overshot that a little bit too, uh, a little bit too. Um, well, oh no, wait a minute. He's got um, yeah, it's it's about four point eight million. So he was a little a little more optimistic perhaps than should have been. Yeah. In terms of the voter turnout, okay, get about 4.8 million. Uh, well, 4.9, almost, oh, almost five, almost, there. almost five. Is that half a million people? Well, you say almost there, half a million people. You understand? Oh, he said five and is, half million. Yeah, he said he said at least five and a half million. So, uh, you know, he's a he's a little bit off there. Okay, uh, let's see what else are we looking at here. I think the more interesting predictions he made was that um, this, you know, business about the governor. Remember, he said that the Democrats should have a really good opportunity to win and, and may, you may see a Democratic victory as early as 2014 
but certainly by 2018, right? Did he say that? Am I remembering correctly? Okay. So let's see what let's see what the numbers look like there. So here we have the um, 2010 election. He, the Democrat Bill White, only gets 42.3%. Uh, you can see that in 2014, the Democratic candidate Wendy Davis didn't even get 39% of the vote. Okay. So Mr. Murray, Professor Murray, must have been considerably disappointed by that. And then the most recent gubernatorial election, you can see that again, the Democrat, Lupe Valdez, only gets less than 43% of the vote. So the point is, that at least in gubernatorial elections, the numbers haven't changed much. This top-down strategy that he's talking about, I don't think he actually used the terminology top-down strategy. That's what I'm calling it. But he's talking about you know, one way that the Democrats, he envisions the Democrats returning to be a competitive force in elections in Texas is by picking off the top of the ballot, by picking off the highest office in the state, which is the governor's office. Now, I will say that, you know, the trend doesn't seem to be working out the way that Mr. Murray, uh, Professor Murray uh, predicted, but, you know, there's there are other top of the ballot races for example, um, this is this would be a consider, consider a, a top of the ballot race in a non-presidential election year, right? You remember a couple of years ago when you had that race between uh, Ted Cruz and uh, Beto O'Rourke, which was one of the closest senatorial elections in Texas in a long time. So this this was pretty close, and it gave Democrats and probably Professor Murray uh, some reason for optimism. That maybe the maybe Texas really was becoming, uh, you know, a place where the Democrats might uh, have a chance. But but look what happened last year in the uh, senatorial election between John Cornyn, John Cornyn and uh, M.J. Hagar. Right, you get back more to normal. Right, very interesting. Right, that in the 2020 election, where you have nationally such a competitive presidential election. Um, you have uh, you have a sort of a tick back, so to speak, uh, with a very clear margin of victory for John Cornyn. I think people voting as most mainly might just care about presidential. Sure, sure, but I, you know that issue aside, uh, I think certainly Democrats, and I suspect that Professor Murray, as a political scientist, were sort of looking at 2020 as an election where we would see in the Senate race and in U.S. House races, the governor wasn't on the ballot in, in 2020, right? But so in those other top of the ballot races, presidency aside, I mean, there were some, including Beto O'Rourke, who believed that Texas was in play at the presidential level. Do you remember the news reports, uh, you know, before the November election last year where Beto O'Rourke was trying to convince uh, the Biden campaign to come to Texas because he thought that based on his campaign and the closeness of his campaign, that there was an opportunity there for uh, for Biden to actually win Texas, but the Biden campaign saw it differently. Right? They, uh, they didn't come here. They didn't really spend much money here at all. Yeah. I think one of their trucks or something actually went over here, but that didn't last long. Well, I think, the, I think the vice presidential candidate, Kamala Harris, did make a trip to Texas around that time, but Biden himself did not come. And they And more importantly, they didn't really invest any campaign resources in Texas. They knew they were. They, they yeah. just they, sort of wrote it off. Yeah. I'd be surprised how many voted for O'Rourke. I mean, he was very anti, you know, gun. I'm surprised they did that one in Texas. Uh, the dynamics were a little bit different in 2018. Remember, that was the midterm election where so many Democrats were elected to Congress. It was the election where the Republicans lost control of the House of Representatives. Um, they had a majority in the House of Representatives and the Democrats regained control of that. Many people believe that that would continue in 2020. And of course, the Democrats maintained control of the U.S. House of Representatives in the 2020 election, but they asked their margin actually shrank a little bit, right? The congressional elections, despite what happened at the top of the ballot with Joe Biden, the, uh, the congressional elections, both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate races, really did not play out the way the Democrats wanted, okay, nationally. In Texas in particular, 
they didn't play out the way that Texas Democrats had thought that they might, um, as you can see in the in the senatorial race here. Okay. Now the bottom up strategy. Um, again, he doesn't call it bottom up strategy, but that's what he's describing, right? He says that another way for the Democrats to return as a competitive force is to start having successes in the state legislature. And in fact, he kind of describes that uh, almost in terms where essentially saying it's inevitable, right? He attributes it to, you know, just the demographic changes that it's going to be virtually impossible, he says, after, uh, you know, 2016, 2018, certainly by 2020, for the Republicans to maintain control of the Texas House of Representatives and maybe the Texas Senate, all right? So let's, let's, let's see how those played out. So here we're going to start in the 82nd Texas legislature. That's the legislature that met 2011-2012. Uh, and you can see that in the Texas Senate, okay, it's not talking about the body that Ted Cruz and John Cornyn belong to, right? We're talking about the body in Austin, okay, the Texas Senate that has 31 members, okay? You can see that at that time, Republicans held over 61% of the seats in the Texas Senate, and in the Texas House of Representatives, they held two-thirds of the seats, okay, over two-thirds of the seats, okay? So as we move now to each two-year election cycle, let's see what happens to those percentages, because again, what Murray is predicting is that with each uh, election cycle, you should see democratic strength increase. What is it at now? Well, we're going to get to that. Oh, okay. okay. So here we are in the 82nd. Now we're in the 83rd. And you can see the Democrats pick up a few seats in the House of Representatives. They go from 49 seats in the House of Representatives to 55. Okay. But the split in the Senate is still the same. Okay. So only very negligible uh, improvement there for Democrats. As we go to the 84th legislature, the Democrats actually lose a seat in the Texas Senate. And they lose seats okay? in the House of Representatives. And they lose, what are they, how many they lose in the House? They, they lose three in the House of Representatives. Okay, so 2014 uh, election was not a good election for Democrats. And Murray must have been disappointed by that. Again, remember Murray's aspirations are, he confesses at the beginning of his talk that he's a moderate Democrat, but I think we can take him at his word that what he's really aspirational for is not democratic control of Texas politics, but two-party competition. competition. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's see what happens as we move to the 85th legislature. Okay. Again, the Democrats pick up those three seats or the three seats that they lost in the previous cycle. And what happens here? They stay the same in the Senate. Okay. All right. Now here's the here's the big one, right? Because this is the one he says we should begin really to see a real possibility of Democrats having control or having a majority of the seats. And you can see it just stays the same in the 85th legislature. No, this, by the way, is the election. Um, oh, excuse me. This one is the election that saw the blue wave in Congress. OK, now, did that translate in Texas? Well, you can see the split in the Texas Senate remains pretty much as it had been, okay? And the Democrats did pick up some seats. They go from 36% or 38% to almost 45%, okay, in the 2018 election, okay? But what happened in 2020? Now, if you go back and look at the news reports from last fall, you look at the Houston Chronicle or the Austin American Statesman or the Dallas Morning News, right? One of the, or the Texas Tribune or something like that. One of the state or local news sources, you're going to see articles where Democrats are pretty optimistic about their chances of maybe even retaking the Texas House of Representatives. Okay, but let's see what happens here. They actually, in the Texas House of Representatives, notice that they pick up one seat. They go from 12 to 13, and then the House of Representatives, it's the same. There's no improvement there for the Democrats. So 
Look, <clears throat> again, I'm not trying to dump on Professor Murray, okay? <laughs> it's pretty clear, though, that he, his timetable at least, uh, the, the kindest thing that we can say is that his timetable didn't play out. You know, maybe we'll see the changes that he's predicting, that he predicted way back in 2010. Maybe we'll see it in the decade that we're now getting into, but we certainly didn't see it over the 10-year period that he predicted that it would happen. So these, what he's attributing to the demographic changes, the population changes, the growth of the Latino population particularly, but also the growth in the Latino population as a percentage of the vote, the aging of Republican voters, it just didn't turn, it didn't produce the results that he was suggesting it would produce. Yeah, Mom? Uh, would you also say that in Portugal from California might also do something like that? Or at least not uh, say that again? You think people from California moving here would also do it? Yeah. I think it's a lot of Um, is there a uh, strong evidence that there's been a huge influx into Texas of people from California? If, the, if that's true, I'm not disputing it, but if that's true, we might want to look at how big that is. And we also might want to look at who it is that's moving, right? Who, who has moved from California to Texas? Mm -hmm. Um, if we're talking about mainly, if we're talking about mainly white, you know, middle income um, to upper income Californians moving to Texas, that might produce one effect. If we're talking mainly about Latino migration to Texas, that might produce another effect. Um, it's certainly a mistake, though, to think about the Latino vote as monolithic Democrat. I mean, there, you know, there's, there's actually, Democrats get a majority of the, of the Latino vote in Texas elections but there's a substantial minority of Latino voters that vote Republican yeah. for, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. I always thought that more Latinos would vote Republican just because they tend to have, they share some similar values like they don't believe in like abortion, for example, as much, you know, both them are against. Really I think you're right. When, when the issues in a campaign tend to be over social issues, like when that's the focus of a campaign, we see in Texas, you know, the Mexican American vote in Texas tends to be more conservative. When the issues in the campaign tend to focus more around economics, right, and perhaps immigration issues, then there even in those even in those election campaigns that tend to focus on the social issues, the cultural issues. A majority of Mexican American voters in Texas do still vote for Democrats, but the Republican share increases. The, the minority that votes Republican is bigger in those elections. When it's about economics, that Republican share tends to be smaller. And but as I started to say, we certainly don't nationally. We don't want to think about um, the Latino vote as monolithic because. It just depends on what part of the country and what part of the Latino population you're talking about. We know, for example, that Cuban American voters tend to be much, in Florida, for example, tend to be much more likely to vote Republican. There's some age differences there. Younger Cuban voters tend to skew a little bit more towards Democrats, but, um, you know, as it stands now, the overall Cuban population in Florida tends to vote pretty heavily Republican. And that's one of the things that happened in 2020 in the presidential election, uh, that, you know, the Biden campaign had some hopes. I think they began to realize in the final days, but they had some hopes there for a long time that they were going to be able to win Florida. But then they redid the calculation. They realized they really didn't need Florida. You know, Florida is a state in presidential elections that going back to the 2000 election really has been pretty important, okay? And it, you know, in terms of the outcome, the national outcome, most obviously in the 2000 presidential election. But I thought I'd share this with you too, because again, Murray doesn't really talk about too much about the chances of a Democratic candidate winning the popular vote in Texas. But you can see that um, it's not, 
you know, it's still, Texas is still pretty strongly a Republican state, right? You can see that Biden only got 46% of the vote. Um, Hillary Clinton only got 43% of the vote. Obama only got 41 and 43% respectively going back a few election cycles. Okay. So we don't see much movement. Well, you know, I mean, again, the difference between 46% for Joe Biden and certainly 41% here for Barack Obama is pretty significant. But from one election to the next, we don't, we haven't seen that. Okay. Questions, comments? So poor, uh, poor Professor Murray. Um, he had uh, some predictions that he, I'm sure, was convinced were going to play out, but they just don't seem to have played out. All right, let me uh, let me do this real quick because I'm really worried that I'm not going to be able to find a version of this that is going to work for us. Give me just a second. Those of you who are online, hang with us for a minute. We had a little trouble, I did, had a little trouble at the start of the class meeting or before the class meeting and opening a particular file. I'm taking a second shot at it here. We may have to just wing it without visuals. Like the old days. Yeah, let me take one more shot. Bear with me here for just a second. Yeah, I just did. Yeah, that's Give me just a second here. Yeah, I think there's some problem here. Corrupted file somehow. Let's see. I'm about to give up on it. One more little try here. Well, it's not the one I want, but we're going to we're going to go with this. Okay, so I want to back up from everything that we've said about Murray and the five party years in Texas, or possibly a six party year in Texas. I want to talk just more generally about political parties, and um, I'm not going to go through all this because we don't have the time. But let me begin by suggesting to you a basic 
Um, hey, what do you guys uh, who are online see on the screen? Do you see a white screen? Okay, thank you. All right, so I want to suggest a basic notion um, for you about what a political party is, because um, in my experience in, in teaching introductory college political science courses, um, a number of people seem to have some difficulty understanding what really what the role of a political party is. You know, I think Americans kind of have, and I would include Texas in this as well, Americans kind of have a love-hate relationship with political parties in a sense, is my impression. On the one hand, we think that, um, you know, we, we recognize that political parties are part, are part of modern democratic politics, Democrat with a small d, okay? That is to say, in democratic countries, and democratic political systems, there are political parties. There's really no exception to that, right? You know, if you, if you look at the major democratic countries around the world, in the United States and Canada and the UK and all the European countries and Asian democracies like Japan or, uh, you know, New Zealand and Australia or, you know, Israel or India, wherever around the world we have democracy, we also see that there are political parties. And <laughs> that's really something that we can't dispute. So I think Americans have some sense of that political parties are going to exist and they maybe there's even some purpose for them in democratic systems, although we're not really quite sure what that purpose is, perhaps. On the other hand, when it comes to our party system, this is the hate part of it. Um, we tend to think that they're obstructionist, that they don't really have, that the parties don't really have uh, much concern about um, good governance, that really all they're interested in is advantage over their opponents. You know, So that's what I mean when I say that we kind of have a love-hate relationship. Okay, So what I want to do is kind of just get back to basics, so to speak, and try to suggest to you you know, on that first part about, you know, why political parties exist in democracies, you know, you know, try to provide some explanation for why that's the case, okay? So let me back up here. I want to suggest three interrelated, if I can find the right spot, sorry. I want to suggest three interrelated propositions, okay, for you. Here we go, okay. So the first is that what I just said a moment ago, that where democracy exists in modern political systems, there are also strong, vital, and competitive party systems. Again, if we, ha we don't have a map of the world or a map of any kind. We have that periodic table over there of the elements on the wall. But if we had a map on the wall, you know, and we, like, I, I have some darts here, and we're just going to give you an opportunity to throw a dart at the map and let's say that um, Darian goes first for us. He throws the dart at the map. Um, pick your favorite country. What does it hit? It doesn't. It lands on a landmass. It doesn't land on the ocean. <laughs> Just pick any country you want. France. Okay, France lands on France. And I say, hey, Darren, I don't know how much you know about France and its politics, but uh, would you consider it to be a democracy? And he's nodding and said yes, for those of you who can't see him. He's nodding and says yes. And I think that, objectively speaking, we should refer to France as a, think about France as a democracy. I think virtually any political scientist would tell you that France is a democracy. Now, second, if I was to ask him, again, I don't know how much you know about French politics, you know enough to know that it's a democracy, does it have a competitive party system? And he says, yes, it does. Right? And he's right, it does. Okay? And next we go to Doreen and she takes her toss and it hits it hits what? Kenya. I'm from Kenya. Oh, Kenya. Okay. Um, you must know more than the rest of us, uh, clearly, about Kenyan politics. Would you consider Kenya to be a democracy? Yes, it is. Okay. Does Kenya have a competitive party system? Yes, it, is. Yes, it does have a competitive party system. Okay. Um, next we go to Taylor. Taylor takes her shot, it hits what? It's Germany, right? You think Germany's a democracy? Yes, yes. okay. Uh, does Germany have a competitive party system? Yes. 
You bet, it does, okay? We, we go to Miles, he throws it, and it hits. I'm going to assign one to you, Miles, because I want to make sure we get this part in. Miles throws it, and it hits the People's Republic of China. Miles, would you consider the People's Republic of China to be a democracy? Yeah. Is the People's Republic of China a democracy? Nope. No, it's not a democracy. Does it have a competitive party system? No, it has a Communist Party monopoly. It doesn't have a competitive party system. It has a one. It's a one-party monopoly, right? North Korea. No, it's not a democracy. No, it doesn't have a competitive party system. South Korea. Yeah, South Korea is a democracy. It has a competitive party. You see what I'm saying? We can make a list up here on the board. We can make a list up here on the board of democracies and not democracies, right? And all the countries of the world, 193 countries we can put into one of those two columns. And when we get to the second question and say, do they have a vital competitive party system, yes or no, we would see that the lists are pretty much identical, right? In other words, one of the things that political scientists, such as myself, are trying to say is that democracy is really contingent upon, it's not just a coincidence that democracy is really contingent upon the existence of a competitive party system. Okay? It, it, is, it is the emergence of political parties in modern democracies that really makes it possible to have democracy. Okay? Uh, here's a second proposition. Not now specifically referring to the American system. In a lot of the literature that was written by political scientists in the recent past, say the second half of the 20th century, and maybe even into the early part of the 21st century, political scientists like the eminent Dr. Walter Dean Burnham, who you see there, right? and I'm not going to leave this up here long enough for you to transcribe this passage from him. I really hadn't intended to share it to you. I just, I'm really trying to make a point here about my profession and people, specifically political scientists who study political parties. And Burnham, who was for a long time at the University of Texas in Austin, and one is one of the most renowned highly respected political scientists in the country, in my profession, um, seems to be, if you, if you, you know, gotten the gist of his quote there, that not only are political parties necessary for democracy, but that in the American system, there's something going on that seems to suggest that the parties are on the decline, right? And then, in addition to Barnum, I have one here from the equally respected Frank Soroff, who was for a while at the University of Minnesota. I'm not sure where he's at now, if anywhere. He might be retired or deceased, for all I know. But um, you can see also that Soroff seems to argue that um, political parties are necessary for democracy. And there's some verbiage in here about what's going on in the American system in recent decades has, you know, certain detrimental consequences for democracy. Okay, so that's, that's really the point I'm trying to get to here, is that if we understand that political parties are, that democracy is contingent upon the existence of a competitive party, a vital competitive party system, a healthy, not a dysfunctional party system, okay, but a functional, competitive party system, and if we understand that there are some trends that have occurred over the last half century or so in the American system that have sort of undermined the functions of the political parties, then that leads us to some concern, conclusions, concerning conclusions about the consequences of democracy consequences for democracy in the American system. So you can notice here, this says, the continued decline of the American party system could produce ironic elitist consequences, right? So I'm, I'm going to come back to this. I know that some of you are still trying to feverishly jot that down, but, but let me just show you here, just focus on this part here where, where Soroff says, 
the fear is that the advantage will be on the side of well-organized minorities with other political resources, right? And Burnham says uh, their disappearance, talking about political parties, would only entail the ascendancy of the already powerful, okay? See, they, as political scientists, they understand the critical role that political parties play in democracy. But there's something going on in the American system, they say, that gives cause for concern about the health of American democracy. Now, let me see if I can make these points a little bit differently, visually. Okay, I'm going to suggest a little model to you here. Okay, This is a democratic model, again, small d, not democratic party, but the, a democratic model, a model of democracy that begins here, as you would think a democracy should, with the people, right? individuals at the bottom, and all these, you know, this represents, if we're talking about American society, the you know, 280 million or so adults, whatever it is, uh, that we might consider to be part of the political, uh, as political individuals. Next, what we see in this model are these intermediary institutions, like political parties, but not limited to political parties. We would also include interest groups and mass media, public opinion campaigns and elections here. Okay, Remember that, I'm not going to go back to the slide, but remember the slide that I just showed you where Burnham says their disappearance as active intermediaries. Right? Show you that here in just a second. So in other words, by an intermediary, we mean that these institutions are really positioned between people and their government. Right? And of course, it's the role of government, as we discussed in the very beginning of the semester, to make public policy decisions and actions. Right? So now, why is this a democratic model? What, what about this visual suggests a democratic model? Well, notice the upward flow. Right? It somehow suggests that the policy decisions and actions that are made by government are begin down here at the bottom, right? Like the like the democratic process really, you know, initiates here. But what Burnham and Soroff and other political scientists are, are trying to get us to imagine, let's let's just focus on, let's take, you know, these other ones out and just talk about political parties. Burnham says active intermediary. Their disappearance is active intermediaries. And so let's actually take them out. So that all that we're left with are 280 million individuals and the distant, complex, otherwise remote institutions of government, legislative, executive, and judicial bodies of national, state, local government. Right? Here's the question that I think Burnham and Soft want you to consider at a very basic level. What is it that you can do as an individual or any individual can do? This is you. Right? That's you. Right? What can you do? And be realistic about this. What can you do as an individual that can have a meaningful impact on government decision making? The policy decisions and actions made by government. Tell me something that you can do. Because if we're talking democracy, there's got to be some connection between individuals and their government, right? Nobody can come up with anything? Nothing you can do? Yeah, go ahead. Wait, so um, are you asking, like, what an individual can do protected with, like, both parties? And it has to be democratically, right? Yeah, I'm asking you, like, think about your options as an individual, working at, alone as an individual, not in coordination with a political party or any other group of individuals. Notice we took interest groups out of there as well. What can you do? and be realistic about it, that you believe really has a legitimate chance at influencing a response of government on this Positive issue. Uh, what, uh, it, it, to influence it in the, the outcome that you want. I presume that okay. most individuals want positive outcomes. They don't want know, negative outcomes, right? Some people can do some crazy things to get some reactions. But, but, some I like to do some things, but that's yeah. not how I would want to do well, it. You can in, you can engage in crazy, yeah, like what do you consider to be crazy activity? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? I don't know what that means. What do you think is crazy? Oppose, like, you oppose stop existing. 
existing, you know. No, I want you to, t I don't want you to, I want you to be specific here. I want you to tell me something that you can do. Okay. That, One person. That you can do. Uh, what? I don't think there's anything that you can do for me. Well, you're, okay, you're a skeptic. Yeah. We're, we're going to come back to you, okay? Yeah. Somebody who is more optimistic and believes that you can have some kind of impact. Well, it, the way you get the impact can be very positive, but you get impact. It'd probably be Just say it. Violence. Violence, violence yeah, uh -huh. yeah. One person exacting violence on who or what? Do well, you think I, that might produce some kind of policy result that you're looking for? Or are you I, talking about with a mob scaling the walls of a capital and, you know, well, but then you're not acting alone. You're acting in concert with other individuals, right? Can I, can I bring you an example? I've asked you about five times to give me an okay, example. Okay, so yeah. have you, has anybody seen the movie Joker? Seen the movie, the movie what? So, I don't want to spoil But anyway, basically, one man makes one decision and it changes everything for everybody. And the government changes everything as well. <laughs> this is hot. This is fiction. He does violent thing at, on national TV and everybody sees it. And they, it, like, they go, you know what? Forget this. He's right. And they, it starts a revolution, basically. Um, and then the government responds. Well, but then you're still a revolution. Is that, is that a realistic scenario or is that just well, I mean, it fiction? Could be because it's, think about how, it's, that, was, that was based in the 70s. Think about how social media and TV is bigger now, if you see what I'm saying. But that's mm -hmm. still a group, a revolution. Well, yeah, no, but one person started it. Well, okay, if it's to be one person that eventually becomes a group, then you might have some, a different recourse available. Yeah, I do find it interesting that you all went to extra legal means first. <laughs> well, generally, <they're... laughs> it's it's hard any to... legal or, for lack of a better term, yeah, mainstream yeah. things that you can undertake. I mean, Rosa Parks. What? You can write a letter to your representative. Okay, now I want you to be brutally honest with yourself. On a probability scale of zero to one, where zero means no chance it's having any effect at all and one meaning that it's an absolute certainty that it has an effect what would you put the probability that your letter is going to influence the decision of let's say we're talking about congress or the texas legislature since this is a texas government court on a probability scale of zero to one maybe not an absolute zero but maybe as our mathematician friends might say asymptotically approaching zero <laughs> that, now but let me ask you a little bit different question okay maybe you can't have much of an impact if you write a letter Do, can you think of anybody who could write a letter or contact mm -hmm. a representative okay. that okay. might have a greater chance of having an impact give me a name like Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos. A political Anybody figure. else? A big contributor to Bill Gates. Right. Elon Musk. Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. You you seem to think that people. I assume that you're attributing it to their wealth, right? That people who have wealth, when they speak, whether it's through writing a letter or whatever contact it is they have with this elected representative, that it stands a much greater chance of having an effect than if you do it. Oh, what, now wait a minute. What is what does Burnham say here? He no, says, please. but only until the ascendancy of the already powerful, right? And what does Soroff say? He says, um, the fear is that the advantage will be on the side of the well-organized minorities with other political resources, like what money, right? You see, what I'm really trying to get at here is if you take the intermediaries out, and particularly if you take political parties out, all you're left with is individuals and their own devices. And for most of us, we don't have the kind of individual power that would allow us to have an impact, a real meaningful impact on government. So these intermediary institutions emerge in modern systems and particularly political parties to allow people where they can't have an individual impact to have a collective impact, okay? Now the reason that political parties are different from interest groups and some of these other things that we talk about is that political parties are really the only institutions in a political system that are really concerned about building majority consensus. Interest groups 
to the extent that majority consensus runs against their interest, aren't really interested in democracy at all, right? They're only interested in getting the outcome that they want. But political parties, by their very nature, have to build majority consensus, whether that's before an election or after an election. It really just depends on the nature of the system. But that's what they have to do. They have to build majority consensus. So what happens then in modern political systems is that these people organize, who are otherwise disaggregated and unable to have impact individually, they find some basis for organizing themselves into a political party. And I'm using the conventional red and blue distinctions here, right? If you like those kinds of distinctions here. So that, you know, some people are blue or they at least lean blue, right? Some people are red, they at least lean red, right? And when they can organize themselves into a coalition called a political party that is able to take over and control government, by the way, how do they do that? How does the political party take over and control government? It's very, it's not a trick question. It's a very, it's as straightforward as you think it is. By winning an election, right? But when you win enough seats in the legislature, for example, you take over, have a majority in the legislature, you take over control of the agenda, right? And presumably then when those people are in a position, in position, they can make public policy decisions and actions consistent with the values and the interests expressed by these people that are part of this coalition down here. That is the democratic nature of this model. It's a bottom-up model in the sense that the political party is a, a mechanism, is a vehicle through which individuals can take over and control government. Yes? So you say like a rise of stronger third parties would actually help elites because then that's more infighting between parties um, it may not mean that. I mean, I can imagine a scenario where you might be able to make that argument, but it might just mean that um, it, if, for example, if you had, in the, if we're applying this to the American system, if you had a third party that could consistently get enough votes that would prevent either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party from having a majority of seats in the United States Congress, bear in mind that in the United States Congress today, and really historically for the last 100 years, at any given time, you've had no more than one or two members of Congress that have been anything other than a Democrat or Republican. For example, currently in the United States Senate, you have 100 members and they are either, Demo all, either Democrats or Republicans, except for two senators, that's actually high, that's a high number, uh, Bernie Sanders of Vermont and his neighbor to the north, Angus King of Maine, who both ran as independents, but as many of you probably know, at least with Bernie Sanders, caucuses with the Democrats. He is functionally a Democrat, right? As well as Angus King, okay? So it's by virtue of the fact that those two senators, um, Democrats have a 50, have 50 of the seats. Republicans have 50 of the seats, but as you know, uh, Kamala Harris represents that potential tiebreaker, okay? So, uh, if you look at the United States House of Representatives, I'm not sure exactly what the number is now, but I would be surprised if there was more than one or two uh, members of that 435 membership, 435 members of the House of Representatives. There may not be any currently, to be honest with you. They're all either Democrats or Republicans, maybe one or two who are not, okay? But if you look at it historically, okay, so now given that fact, if you had a third party Libertarian Party or the New Alliance Party or the Constitutional Union Party or some anti-Trump Republican Party that was to emerge and be able to siphon off votes from one or both of the two major political parties and even elect members of Congress so that none, neither of the two major parties, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, had a clear majority in Congress, you would still need a majority in order to pass legislation. And so the coalition building then would occur as it does in many parliamentary systems after the election, right? In many parliamentary systems, for example, you have that exact scenario where no single political party has an outright majority and they have to build coalitions with other parties because you still have to have a majority in order to pass legislation. One good example of a country that works that way, and it's, I use this as an example 
um, not because I am you know intimately familiar with their politics, but it's just it's something that's in the news a lot, and so maybe some of you uh, uh, can appreciate what I'm saying here. Israel is, a, is an example of a country that in its uh, history, its short history of the modern state of Israel, going back to 1948, they've never had a government where a single political party has an outright majority in the in the parliament. They call it the Knesset. Okay? Uh, it's always been governed by coalitions. Now, the current prime minister of Israel is a man by the name of Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, and he's the leader of the Likud party. It's a conservative party in Israel. But there's something like 24 or 25 political parties that have seats in the Israeli Knesset. In the United States Congress, in our national parliament, we have two political parties that have seats. They have something like two, maybe two dozen. All right? And so Netanyahu's party, the Likud party, probably only has, I didn't, I'd have to look at the numbers to be sure, but he, they probably only have about 20% of the seats in the legislature. They can't pass legislation on their own. They can't take like an attitude like, well, we won the election and Netanyahu is the prime minister, so, you know, to hell with everybody else, we're just going to pass the legislation that we want because what would happen? Those other political parties would form a coalition against the Likud party and they would say, not so fast. We now have a majority and we're going to select the prime minister and you're out and your agenda is out. Right? So they have to be willing to make deals. And that's the main difference between parliamentary systems and the American system. And Texas is part of the American system, right? It, Texas is not really different in this respect. The main difference between, as I see it, between the American two-party system and the multi-party systems, I assume Kenya has a multi-party system, right? Uh, and the multi-party systems of other, most other democracies around the world is when the coalition building takes place. In the American system, it has to occur before the election, for the most part. In those parliamentary systems, it can and usually does occur after the election. Okay? But it doesn't change the fundamental point that I'm trying to get at here, which is that that's, if democracy means anything, it means that the majority, people who are otherwise individually powerless, have not only the right, but also the capability of taking over and controlling government for their ends. That must be what democracy as a practical matter must mean. All right? Okay, so with all of that in mind, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over a lot of stuff here because we just don't have a lot of time. But let me get this part in here real quick. Okay. Just to sort of give you a working description. This really isn't so much a definition as it just is sort of a description. Political parties have three purposes. They organize individuals, but it's not organization for the sake of organization. That's not the end. That's just a means to an end. Why do they organize people? Well, so they can capture government. They can take over and control government. What do we say that taking over and control government means as a practical matter? Winning elections, okay? They like organize people. Why? So that they can win elections. And that also, for many Americans, I think, in their understanding of how the parties work, that's the end. Yeah, that's all that's all it's about. All the Democrats want to do is win. All the Republicans want to do is win. But is that really is that do you think that's really accurate? Why did the Republicans want to win? Why did the Democrats win? It's a substantive orientation, right? So that they can they can advance their agenda. That's right. So that they can make public policy. Okay? So again, it's that bottom up notion. They're organizing the individuals to win elections, and they want to win elections in order to make public policy that's consistent with their philosophy and their platforms, right? Their, their party's platform. What is a platform? It's a statement of the party's philosophy and also includes specific policy initiatives. Like it probably wouldn't surprise anyone that in the, the National Democratic Party, in the party platform, there's probably a plank that calls for an increase in the minimum wage. 
that probably wouldn't surprise anyone. If you went online and looked at the Democratic Party platform, it's real easy to find in the age of the internet, right? Just go, you know, Google democrats.org or something like that, or type in democrats.org, and you're maybe one or two clicks away from the party platform. You read that document, I bet you find in there somewhere a call to increase the minimum wage. And what is probably easily is easily predictable in the Republican Party is you might find a plank in their platform that calls for um, um, voter photo ID laws that each state should adopt requirements to have photo ID laws. I don't know that that's in there, but I certainly wouldn't be shocked if it was in there. Okay. All right. So, questions about that basic description of what a political party is and why it's a democratic, why well, there's a democratic theory underlying that. All right. I'm going to skip over this business. Okay. Let's touch on this next. Okay. The French political scientist Maurice de Rouge number of years ago distinguished between two different types of political parties what he called a cadre party system which is dominated by political elites and is mainly concerned with contesting elections in a cadre party system the influence of outsiders is restricted they're only required to assist in election campaigns. An example of the cadre party system would be in the first party era in the United States, the, from the very beginning after the ratification of the Constitution, the emergence of the first party system between Federalists and Jeffersonian Republicans. So during that period and then through the very early part of the 19th century, maybe down to about the 18 teens maybe 1820s would have been characterized as a cadre party system. As distinguished from a mass membership party system, which unites hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of followers in an attempt to base itself on an appeal to the masses, and the U.S. by the 1830s, certainly, you have during what the historians refer to as the Jacksonian era. We've dealt with the Jacksonian era in a different context in this course earlier this semester. Remember when we were talking yeah. about the Texas Constitution during the 1830s, 1840s, even though the Texas Constitution that we now have is a little bit later from 1875, it still reflects the values and the ideas that we find during this period. Well, one of the things that we find with the party system during this period is really the beginnings of reaching out to ordinary citizens and bringing ordinary citizens into the political process. We've established previously, for example, that property qualifications for the right to vote began to be dropped in this era. So that by the time we get to the 1830s, certainly the 1840s, but by the time Texas becomes a state in the United States, for example, property qualifications have pretty much been dropped everywhere around the United States as, as a requirement for the right to vote. We still had all kinds of other impediments based on race and gender and so on, but uh, at least there, here's where you begin to see the origins of mass participatory democracy. And it's the political parties really that are organizing and reaching out and bringing in these ordinary voters into the political process for the first time. Okay? And then in the 20th century, early part of the 20th century, for example, we have the advent of the direct primary. Remember, we talked about the direct primary last week. We said the direct primary is a process where ordinary voters select the party's candidates. Well, consider that before the 20th century, party candidates for whatever the office was, Congress or state representative or whatever the office was, were selected by party bosses. Okay? Right. 
So this is a democratizing, at least in theory, it's a democratizing change. And it's just part of that broader drift towards expanding participation. Okay, and again, the parties play the critical role in that. Obviously, if it's a process of the parties used to nominate candidates, it's party driven. The first direct primary, if I remember correctly, I believe was um, held in Wisconsin in 1914. <laughs> the LaFoyle progressive movement. Um, was very strong and Robert LaFoyle was a progressive leader in the early part of the 20th century. It was very strong in getting the direct primary initially established in Wisconsin. By the time you get, that's 1914, by the time you get to the 1930s, if, less than 20 years later, every country in the United States is using the direct primary to a greater or lesser extent. So it happened very quickly. All right, here's another sort of basic idea we're almost out of time. Let me see. Be choosy here about. Let me let me end on this point, okay? But I wanted to talk about why a two-party system as opposed to a multi-party system and so on, but we're just going to have to end on this, okay? Um, the structure of the American party system parallels the federal system, okay? So I guess really what I'm trying to say here is that even though we say in the United States we have a two-party system, Democratic Party and Republican Party, you should really understand that there's not just one Republican Party and one Democratic Party. The Just like we don't have just one government in the United States, we have one national government, then we have 50 state governments, and then we have literally tens of thousands of local governments, whether they're cities or counties or special district governments like school districts and so on. Okay, so just like you have that federal structure in our system of government, you also have a federal structure in our party system. So we don't just have a, a Democratic Party, we have a national Democratic Party, 50 state Democratic parties, and then literally tens of thousands of Democratic parties at the precinct, county, congressional district level. Okay? We have a national Republican Party, 50 state Republican parties, and then literally tens of thousands of Republican parties at the local precinct county, et cetera, level, okay? So why is that important? Well, historically it's been important because there have been times um, in not, and maybe even we're in one of those periods right now where um, the national party may be at odds with state parties, right? For example, in the middle part of the 20th century, if you were, if we go to like 1950s and the, certainly by the 1960s, if we look at the National Democratic Party platform on issues, civil rights issues and race, racial equality issues, it was, would be described as progressive, right? calling for changes and reforms in the law. If you look at the state Democratic Party platforms of Texas and Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas and most of the other, state, other southern states, you would find that they were extremely conservative. All right, and that was a that was a big problem for Democrats in the middle part of the 20th century and into the, really the latter part of the 20th century. We may be seeing a similar thing right now with the Republican Party. If you the National Republican Party platform today, okay, the current Republican is more conservative, I think. Whereas the the National Democratic Party platform in the middle part of the 20th century was more progressive than many state Democratic Party platforms. Today, the National Republican Party is far more conservative than many state Republican Party platforms. Right. And that doesn't just owe to the candidacy of Donald Trump. I think it actually precedes Donald Trump. We can go back at least to the Tea Party era a decade ago, but maybe even before that, where the National Republican Party was becoming decidedly more conservative than, say, the Republican parties in places like, you know, some of the, maybe some of the upper Midwest states or the Northeastern, a place like New Hampshire or, or, or Vermont or someplace like that. Okay.
we are just out of time. I wish we had more time to talk about these things, but unfortunately we do not. So we will see you next week. I'll see you. See you later.